Last semester I mentioned that I wanted to give an award to anybody who could use multiple screens, and I figured I ought to at least uh, 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 listen to myself on this, but I ought to at least try <laughs> to do something that's more than just one screen, but uh, some of them are unplugged. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, uh, agent computing uh, for economics and finance, obviously kind of a general topic that uh, many of us in the room work on. Uh, let me just mention that the next week there's going to be uh, Professor Howie Wang from GW will be here. He's an expert on high performance uh, computing and networks. And so, uh, thank you, Joe. That's got it. Yeah. High, per high performance computing and networks, and uh, he'll be telling us about uh, algorithms and other hardware uh, for software hardware for doing uh, high speed network calculations. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, as I said, this broad topic. Uh, here's the background, which I think was mentioned in the, in the uh, abstract, with that. Uh, uh, with uh, my colleague from uh, Santa Fe Farmer, Don Farmer, and I, uh, we sit, he, he's sitting in Oxford now, we are invited to, um, to provide an overview, to, to write an overview article for a general purpose, uh, a, a general interest economics journal uh, <coughs> on, on agents. And so the, 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 the thought about this paper was that uh, it should be uh, an article that describes the advantages to economists of, of learning enough computing to do agent-based modeling, okay? So you have to assume that the audience does not know very much computing, assume the audience does not, does not really know what agent-based models are, and, in, and you know, provide the incentives or provide the, uh, you know, provide motivation for the uh, audience to, uh, you know, try it, try, try something new, okay? So th that's the point of departure here. And uh, what what the paper is about, uh, you know, mostly done, uh, well, it's, we're, we're still adding it back and forth, uh, but I'm very happy to have you guys comments on it. I'm, in particular, I'm going to advance you know three or four ideas here for you know what I, what, what we think are you know some important ways that that uh, uh, mainstream economists might adopt agent computing for their own benefit. And so I'm very happy to have you guys' <coughs> opinions about w which of the arguments you find most persuasive and which you find uh, not so persuasive. Okay. Okay. So the audience for this journal that, that Brett has, we're passing it around. The audience basically are going to be you know kind of imagine youngish research economists. I'll, I'll, speak, I'll say a little bit in a, in a minute why, uh, why the older ones are not really the target audience. The younger economists, now these are people who, who know a fair amount of mathematics. They, in graduate school, they learned uh, you know, econometrics. Uh, they, they know theory. Uh, but they, and they're typically going to be experts in some one domain. You know, think about you know, some <coughs> domain of economics, you know, finance. I've written here environmental econ. These are almost to a person, these are people with really good math skills. And they have you know, modest to uh, vanishing computer skills. Uh, you know, always a, the standard joke in, uh, about, e about economic theorists is that the only only uh, computation they use is word processing. Okay, that's that's, <laughs> the, that's the limit of the of an economic theorist's uh, ability to use his, his or her computer. So the question is, how can we how can we uh, you know address this audience and say that you know there's some things that um, we can do with agent computing that uh, you know are either hard in the conventional world or impossible or something. Now, almost all of you guys in, the, in this room are not novices in this area, right? All of, all of you guys are, know a lot about agents. So it may even be that, um, you know, I, uh, I, should, I should also give this talk to the, uh, you know, to the, to the uh, economics PhD students just to get some feedback from them. I mean, you guys are going to know more than, <coughs> more than most. So, uh, but anyway, but let's uh, see what we can, what we can do here. I, I, over a decade ago, I wrote the paper on the right. And so, uh, I think the basic idea here was how could we extend this? I mean, th th this was an argument uh, to to you know to mostly to quantitative social scientists, to mathematical social scientists. How can they use <coughs> agent computing to their advantage? And in in, the, in this paper, I argued uh, that um, you know there were basically you know two or three different ways that people can use agent computing. People particularly who were training in mathematical economics, in particular, <coughs> uh, you know, the idea that uh, you could just take a very conventional economic model. And you could complement it by having it built with agents. So you could say, you know, the usual economic model, very dry, solve equilibrium. You know, there's some uh, some equations being solved. We can maybe animate it with with agents. But a different, uh, you know, kind of the orthogonal approach would be to say, look, there are many things that you can't do in the conventional approach. So you, we can use agents as a substitute for for conventional theorizing. Uh, and then there was a, even one. There was one example in this paper that uh, had the following character. It said, you know, there are there are a class of problems for which you actually can't even do any formal analysis really, uh, that you really need to, you know, build a simulation in order to figure out what's going to happen with, with the model. So there was a theorem about that in, that, in, that pa in this paper. Um, and the theorem is, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a very specialized thing and not clear how general it is. 
But the main point <coughs> is that this was the argument of this paper. I, I don't want to rehash those arguments. I, I want to talk about something new or talk about a different. Or I want to motivate it somewhat differently. Uh, like, you know, once again, just as, as you know, as it is the case that when I wrote this, art, when we wrote this article, we said you know, we def definitely had in mind mathematical economists who were who were skeptical of age of computing. But I think that there are there are a variety of arguments that I'll, I'll, I'll give today that are not quite this. Maybe there's some flavor of this, but they're, but they're a little bit different. Okay, so so here's how we're going to proceed. So when it comes to building models, and this is this is you know both in economics and beyond. I mean, you, all of you guys working on social networks, sociology, public policy, uh, working in politics. I mean, when we build models, we uh, our models feature a bunch of things. You know, for example, we're either going to have you know how many agents are we going to have? You know, uh, you know a lot or a few? Are we going to have? Uh, are they going to be heterogeneous? Yes or no? I mean, what are the beliefs of the agents? Uh, how are we modeling the institutions that are present in real life? Uh, you know, what is the temporal structure? Is it uh, is it equilibrium? Is it dynamic? Um, are there networks involved? Yes or no? So these are all kind of these are all characteristics of a model, uh, and. Uh, what, what is our approach to data with, with models? And it turns out I've written here, you know, modeling norms in economic and finance. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna assert the next thing, which, uh, which people don't really wanna hear, but that is that there are in fact, you know, kind of social norms that, uh, you know, that we, as, uh, you know, in academia, we teach graduate students. And unfortunately, these, these norms may not have much to do with reality, it's just, it's just the way that the academia works, right? And so here's, uh, here is what I learned in graduate school about all these different uh, about these, all these different characteristics of, of models. That is, you know, uh, number of agents. Well, if I have one agent or maybe two, I can solve the equations. If I have a few, uh, I can probably approximate the answer. I might also, be, by the way, have infinity. I mean, if I have an infinite number of agents, <coughs> I can use some limiting argument and maybe solve that. If I make them too heterogeneous, I can't solve anything. So I gotta make them pretty homogeneous. It turns out if I make them rational, that is, they're all doing what's best for themselves. I can get, you know, use, using the calculus, I can get first order conditions, I can solve for equilibrium, say. Uh, learning, how do agents learn? Well, either they, they don't learn at all or they, they learn individually, for example. We'll see some other ideas about that in a second. Uh, agents have beliefs. How do they get coordinated? How, for example, how does the fact that um, one agent thinks we're on the verge of a, of a recession while well, another agent doesn't think that? Well, in, in, in conventional macroeconomics, we say, well, all those beliefs are, are, are coordinated. There's no cost to doing that. They all, all, all agents have rational expectations. They all have the same expectations, basically. Uh, in conventional economics, conventional social science, who interacts with whom? Well, the default is that there's equal probability of interaction. Everybody interacts with everybody else. It's a well-mixed case. Uh, but, of course, in reality, there are networks involved. Uh, markets. Uh, I don't want to be too pedantic here and go through all the details, but. This is conventional, you know, theory that you know there's one price vector that clears all markets. Uh, there may be no firms at all, at all in, in conventional economics. For example, some of you will know that in general equilibrium theory, right? Uh, one important critique of it is that there are no institutions present. Uh, governance. Well, we say who votes. Well, the median voter determines who gets elected, right? Uh, static equilibrium. You know, that's that's what we saw, saw for. We saw for Nash equilibria. Or is in equilibrium, right? Anyways, all these things are these are the norm that say norm circa 1985 when I you know when I was in, when I was entering graduate school. Okay, <coughs> now how much of this has changed? And the slightly pathetic thing is that very little of this has changed for what we teach graduate students. All of you got most of you guys are graduate students. If any any of you are you know taking graduate micro this semester, I mean you're, you're learning all this stuff. I mean the Moss Colel yep. Green. Uh, Book is full of this stuff, right? Uh, and this, this is the norm. Now, you, this is all the reason. There's a reason why we teach this, and it's because it's all mathematically tractable, right? We, we we know how to solve the equations. We know how to how to write down what the answer is. And importantly, if we start relaxing things, if we say, well, there are not uh, three agents, there are 36. <coughs> well, now we don't know how to solve the equations for 36 interacting agents. I mean, we have a three-body problem. We have some some complicated mathematics, right? What if we make the agents heterogeneous? Well, now it's complicated how to solve them. We don't know how to do aggregation over 36 agents or something, right? So uh, there, are, there are real reasons why uh, we stick to this and why it's a social norm. Uh, uh, but say unfortunately, it's, you know, it's not necessarily the way the world works. Uh, by the way, I, I, I gave this, uh, I showed this uh, diagram at a conference recently. Uh, some of you will know Dick Wagner in the econ department. Uh, his reaction was, uh, was, was yes, th this, is all, this is all wrong. And his, his, re his answer was, we should start over. 
Now the trouble is you, you can't start over. You, you, have to, you, have to, you have to start from what you know. You have to, you have to uh, <coughs> ground a new theory in something. So, so what, what, uh, the final uh, slide here, the final column here is, you know, from a complexity point of view, from a more evolutionary point of view, uh, here's what we'd really, really like to have in all of our models. Uh, and the trouble with all these things on the right-hand side is that, you know, we, they make the model so complicated and so uh, difficult to solve that nobody dares do much of it. I mean, people are doing a little bit of it. For, for example, so, you know, as everybody knows, uh, uh, you know, in our, in our program, adding social networks to models is very important and can, can change the conclusions and make the models different, make them more interesting. So what oftentimes will happen and say, you know, what one, we can think about it as one baby step that's common in, in, uh, in economic theory is say, keep all the stuff fixed, but just put in social networks. Okay, so do all the stuff conventionally, put in social networks. And some of you will know the Matt Jackson book, which is uh, sitting, uh, I, I'm sitting in my office somewhere, but the Matt Jackson book is all about that. Right? You, have, you have rational agents who are more or less homogeneous, uh, uh, self-equilibrium, right? That's the, so that's that. Or um, other things that, uh, you know, uh, we can do here. Things like, um, let's put in, uh, you know, uh, a credible number of agents, a realistic number of agents. Say, let's put in, you know, the, the U.S. private sector is 120 million agents. Well, you would maybe want to have a model with that many, full scale. Uh, so th you'd like to have that. But now, uh, in order to solve that model, maybe you have to keep all this other stuff turned off and do this, okay? So the, you know, the, the social norm aspect then of this figure is that uh, we'd like to do this, but this is what we have. This is what we know how to do. And so how do you start taking steps over here? How do you start walking uh, in this general direction? So the, you know, basically the first motivation that I have you know, for, for why we'd like to uh, introduce a technology like agent computing that uh, uh, is to help us move over in this general direction. Okay, so the assertion that I'm going to put on the next slide is going to be that, uh, you know, unsurprising to all you guys, you know, with with agent computing, we know how to we, we can do things like put in social networks. We can put in disequilibrium dynamics. We can put in, uh, you know, path dependence. Brian Arthur was here a month ago. Brian Arthur, you know, the king of path dependence. Um, we can, uh, you know, we can think about putting in big data into these models, right? So we can policy can be something we evolve, right? In in the world of in the conventional world of of uh, of uh, of the, you know, the old the old-fashioned way of doing social theory you would say okay now that we know how the thing works let's figure out a policy which is going to make it work better and in this world we say well policy evolves right um, there's probably in, in, over the course of this talk there's probably going to be a, a new executive order issued and that'll change policy a little bit right? so <laughs> policy is constantly evolving it's not it's not it's not fixed it's not of course it is in some sense from the top down baby but the, um, anyway, so uh, so I'm going to argue that uh, you know we, we're going to agent computing can, can help us do all this stuff, and so in the paper what we what we try to say in a, as plain way as possible is that uh, is that you know if, if in fact you have aspirations as an economist or as a, you know as a social scientist to, to do some of this stuff over here, one route to do that is 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 by by using agent computing. Now it could be that you are a good enough mathematician that you know how to uh, take the conventional specification, add social networks, let prices be local. Let um, let agents govern themselves, solve for disequilibrium of the economy, <coughs> and uh, you know, then study the path dependence of properties of the economy. Now, that the people who can do that is a very small set of people, right? And kind of vanishingly small, right? It's uh, only the only the you know the best uh, applied mathematicians in the world. So the people who can do economics and finance in the, with trying to turn on all the stuff are going to be limited to the people who can do who are excellent mathematicians. Now, ma all of you in this room have taken a lot of math, as I have, and uh, we can do a lot. Nobody knows how to turn all this stuff on at once and solve those equations. Right? So that's just, it's just too hard. So okay, so the first reason to use agents, and I want to focus a little bit on uh, on you know uh, certain uh, uh, on the, on the, what I basically have just kind of summarized. Is that there's a relatively low mathematical hurdle uh, to uh, to building models when we use agent computing. That is, we, yes, we all want to be better mathematicians. We all want to be be, be able to uh, you know, to do to do more formally and to derive theorems, right? But uh, you know, as a practical matter, in much in much of uh, just just you know, asserting the fact that uh, in much of, of academia today, you know, whether it's you know it's at a, a MIT kind of department or, or, or wherever, it's, you know, until you've had real analysis, differential equations, mathematical probability, theory, unless you have, it's, until you develop a lot of mathematical maturity, it's very hard to make any progress in, in, in the academic research game. It's just uh, you know the, all the all the all the uh, all the mind <laughs> all the uh, all, all the all the good areas to, to mine have been basically mined out with, with, with simpler tools, and you have to basically have uh, more exotic tools in your quiver to make any progress. <coughs> now, there are some people who have observed this situation. There are some people who are not economists 
for example, philosophers of social science who observe this, and they say, it's amazing how many equations, how many theorems there are in any kind of journals. By the way, as a footnote, it, I don't have it in front of me, but in the paper, in this paper that we have drafted, what we did is we went back to, um, uh, to the American Economic Review, and we counted how many theorems, corollaries, lemmas, and propositions there were in every issue of the AER every January, going back 100 years, okay? And what you find is that up until about 1947 or 48, there were none, zero. There are no theorems, lemmas, corollaries, anything. And today, uh, there's a monotone increasing number. Until, until today, you're on, there's an average, there's more than one per article. Right, so now you basically have every article basically, on average, has to have at least one theorem, corollary, something or other in it, where there are none. You know, now it, of course, it is the case that economists today are much better mathematicians. But people like Nancy Cartwright, important philosopher of science at the LSE, she, what she's written is that said that the extreme amount of mathematical competence required to do research in economics means it limits the kinds of people who enter the field. Because you're going to have, you know, and maybe to use a physical, I was thinking, uh, and what, seeing Owen here, so I'm thinking of a physics analogy. You know, you're going to have the Paul Dirac's uh, of, the, of the world entering economics today. But you're not, are these people the best economists? Uh, it's somewhat unclear. So if we can lower the bar somehow, to make it easier to do economics, doing it computationally, we can get uh, you know, a richer set of people in here. And as I've written, you know, when we, uh, so one, maybe one, one in, in this article, we're, we're trying to <coughs> introduce people to aging computing. We're trying to say, you know, you're welcome to, 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 to do this. We're trying to say it's, in some sense, easier than mathematical economics, right? You can, you can uh, it opens the field up to people like policymakers and even the engaged public. Uh, 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 maybe even people with, maybe someday we'll be able to have, uh, you'll be able to run models on your phone. So we, you can go r right from the model to a Twitter uh, account or something. You, know, you can uh, tell the world what your model said. I don't know. But, you know, undergraduates, I mean, that, the whole idea of undergraduates doing research, and this is, in most parts of science, this is still a possibility at least. Uh, in economics, it's not, it's, hard, it's barely possible, right? Because you have to have so much mathematical uh, background uh, in, order to do, uh, in order to do any real economics today. So, okay, so the first argument then is that, uh, um, you know, agents are a way to uh, help you, you know, written to the, to the faculty of, of, of America. It's, it's, uh, you, can, you can introduce your, your, your undergraduates to research. Uh, you can introduce, uh, you know, other people around your community to research uh, through this computational approach. You can give them a model. They can run the model. They can play the model, right? As opposed to, you know, you, you, don't, you, know, you want to give them, uh, you know, how would you engage an undergraduate otherwise? You could say you're going to give them a specification of the general equilibrium structure of the economy and say, you know, Use perturbation analysis to figure out what's uh, what's going to happen to the unemployment rate. Or something. That's you know, it's, it's not credible. Uh, you can you can build a model and, and show that. Okay. On to the uh, second reason why we're using the paper, uh, and this speaks to the idea of uh, <coughs> uh, we want to we know that people are not really rational. Right? There are a whole bunch. There are 150 ways that people depart from rationality. Al Kahneman, Versky, uh, uh, you know, Gigerenzer, uh, Fishoff. All the uh, we we know that all these different ways people apart from rationality. Well, it's really hard to model that mathematically. But, of course, what we do <coughs> with agents is we write down behavior rules. We say, you know, if this, then that, right? If your company has inventory, uh, lower the price. If you're, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not doing so well right now, uh, maybe you have to lay off somebody. If your company's doing really well, you hire somebody, right? So we have these, we have these behavior okay. rules, which could be if then else. They could be things that are derived from experiments. There's a whole variety of ways we can do that. So I've written here that the the uh, agent models are highly expressive, and we can uh, and they're also interpretable. When you say, you know, we have some mathematical model with a coefficient out in front of it, how do you interpret the coefficient? Oftentimes hard to do, but here we can say, well, the rules the agents are following are this are such and such, and we can do things with this. Now, uh, one common critique of Herbert Simon's idea of bounded rationality was that there is just this wilderness of, of bounded rationality. This is one way to be rational. And there are this kind of infinite number of ways you can be boundly rational, and nobody knows how do people how people really are boundly rational. Well, I think that's one way to you know to understand the forest, the wilderness of boundary rationality is to say you know, for example, let's put uh, people in laboratory settings and see what they do. Right? I mean, uh, this is George Mason, so we don't need we don't need to argue this. I think too much, right? That you know we have Vernon Smith's lab here. Vernon Smith won the Nobel Prize a decade ago. Uh, we can put people in laboratory settings and see what, what do they do. I think it's, just as a footnote, we only had one student really uh, last year, Chenna, was the first person to really kind of, you know, he did the whole computational uh, social science core as well as the experimental econ core. 
but my sense is that that's, this is a very pregnant area for, for doing uh, more work. And so in the, in, the, in the paper, we actually highlight about, there's about a dozen good papers that try to do this, basically that try to take experimental data and, and instantiate an agent-based model, or that postulate an agent-based <coughs> model, say we don't know what the rules really are or should be, so let's, so let's run an experiment. So there are, there's a, a small but you know, growing body of literature that, that tries to do this, and I think this is a, you know, a fertile way to, uh, to proceed. Now, when you think about how, most, how much of uh, science progresses you know, outside of economics, outside of the social, social sciences, much of, ec much of science produce, uh, uh, makes progress by saying, look, here's one explanation for, for some phenomenon, here's another one. Which one of those is probably right? Can we learn something by, about one by studying the other one? Can we adjudicate which one is better, et cetera? But in, you know, so, so often in economics, we don't have competing models. We only have, you know, we have one explanation, which is you know, there's some utility maximizing model for it. So I think that one of the, a further uh, argument for, for using these kind of, you know, this behavioral approach is to say that, um, you know, what, when we have two or three models that are all purporting to be <coughs> models of the same phenomena but are somewhat different, we can say things like, you know, well, which one is most behaviorally reasonable? Which one is most plausible? Which one is, uh, you know, it accords with, you know, what the George Mason undergraduates do versus what the, uh, you know, what the Arizona undergraduates do or something, right? Oftentimes what happens today is people say, well, I'd like to augment the XYZ model with a behavioral specification. And the normal answer is, well, you can't do that because you, then you can't solve the model. And it's, just, it's very unsatisfactory to say, well, the, reason, the main reason why I can't explore some behavioral changes, no one knows how to solve it mathematically. But that really is what, that, 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 that's what goes on at the, at the frontier of economics. That what really goes on is that nobody knows how to solve the, the more elaborate models. And to add behavioral rationality is to, you know, the behavioral, uh, behavioral specification is usually, usually to make the models more difficult to analyze. All right? Uh, and then I think that, you know, the, the long-term uh, goal that, you know, that you know, I won't realize, and people my age uh, in this room will not realize, but maybe some of you will realize, is you know, <coughs> today we know how to put rules into models and you know, some of us, so some people have started to dig down into this and you know, some of you will know, you know uh, Epstein uh, was here in November and he started to, to dig down to say, you know, how could you build uh, cognitive models of uh, agents who are doing this? And you know, you know, we are affiliated with Krasna over here, right? So I mean, you can imagine that someday you know, we'll, have a, we'll have biologically grounded models of cognition. We don't have that today. <laughs> we'll have enough computing power to do this, right? So, we'll, so we're today we can do a million agents, but a million simple agents, if we want to do complex agents, we're only going to do maybe 100 or 10 or something. Imagine that, you know, in the future, what you guys can do, uh, you know, a generation out is, uh, you guys can say, you're going to have rich <coughs> cognitive models, maybe even neural models, and you can still have a million agents. And that's something which, you know, today, we, today it's not possible. So, this is, uh, this is, uh, I mean, is it the case that economics, uh, 50 years from now, are still going to be having utility maximizing models? I mean, that's such an impoverished model of behavior that, uh, I mean, there are at least many people, you know, around the the profession who hope not. You, know, you would hope that the uh, Kammerer, uh, Thaler, Lowenstein, Versky, <coughs> Kahneman, all those kinds of, all the, all the behavioral scientists of the current generation will have had enough impact so we will have moved beyond the utility maximizing models of, uh, that have historically uh, been dominant. Okay, so that's the second reason that we try to, uh, now I want you to keep in mind, and I'll, I'll solicit your opinion at the end, do you find the first reason or the second reason more compelling? That is, if, right, th th this one has to do with uh, we can make things more behavioral. The first one just said, you know, there's a lower math bar for, uh, for doing agents. Now the third one, is, this is now a purely utilitarian argument. And here's how it goes. Is that uh, I mentioned that uh, you know, economic theorists, pathological for their only use of computing is for <laughs> word processing. Uh, well, there are branches of economics that do use uh, all the different facets or they, they use different facets of the machine. So what, what, what are, you know, our machine is composed of many different, different <coughs> capabilities, right? Has a CPU, maybe with many cores on it. We have a, we have a bunch of RAM. Uh, everybody's got, uh, how much RAM do you have on that machine? 64 gigs. 64 gig on that machine, right? It's a laptop. You have a lot more RAM, <laughs> uh, big disks, uh, uh, several, million, million display, several million, million pixels of display here, uh, fast networks. You can buy GPU cards, everybody knows. You can also buy, Intel selling these things now, right? The Intel Fee board, it's 60 coprocessors sitting on one board. Uh, new language ideas, uh, you know, you, your models either working on the internet or not, other dimensions here. Uh, so these are all different facets of the machine. Now what I wanna ask in this slide is, you know, 
how do economists use the machine? Okay. Let me just date myself badly here by saying, when I went to when I went to Carnegie Mellon uh, in the eighties. Uh, the Holy Grail was what's called a, a three at the time. A, you can look this up. A 3M machine. Anybody know what a 3M machine was? So there were three. They only cared about three dimensions here. Three dimensions. Mm -hmm. They were you wanted to have one megabyte of RAM, one megabyte of disk space, and uh, one million pixels. That was a 3M machine. <laughs> And uh, so obviously today we're, you know, you're, we're actually but this, this one has not gone up as fast as the other ones, right? This is still, we're still only a few, a few million, but uh, <coughs> how do uh, people who do, now there are, there are, right, there are, I should say in this paper we go through that there are other flavors of computational economics besides agents, but uh, you know, one of the flavors is numerical economics. Now numerical economics <coughs> says we believe all the equations are correct. We believe that uh, utility maximizing agents are the way the world works, but we just can't solve the, you know, the, N equals seven competing firms example, so we're going to use numerics to do it. Now, I assert here that you know people who use people who do numerical economics are really thrashing the CPU a lot. They're working the CPU hard, but they're not filling the, the RAM up very much. They're not necessarily doing using these things. They're not displaying the result. Uh, maybe they're using a NVIDIA card or something. I don't know. They're using Fortran, so I'm not going to say they're not very novel when it comes to languages. But think about it. That um, <laughs> you know, if you, you know, if you have a gigabyte of RAM, it's got 64 gig there. If you have a gigabyte of RAM, can you actually put a Fill a gigabyte, up, gigabyte of RAM up with equations. Imagine if you had to type in, type in a you know a, a million equations into, into your machine. I mean, obviously, you couldn't do it manually. You have to do it, do it automatically somehow, right? I mean, you can't you can't put in a million equations into RAM. Now, people who do physical systems, like climate models, weather models. I mean, those are spatially extended systems, right? So you can fill up all available RAM with the with the spatial process. But in economics, we don't. We typically don't economics proper geography. Not, not the case, but in economics proper, we typically don't do spatial models, so we don't really have any way to use RAM in that natural, spatially extended way. So, in essence, economists, you know, the man from heaven is the machine, right? We're, we, we, are, we are all just lucky to be living through the era when the machine happens, right? The, this gigantic machine falls in our lap. I mean, macroeconomists call this man from heaven. I'm not kidding, that's actually the terminology, right? It's just a, and, uh, uh, and they decide not to use these things. Right? In, this, in this version of the, of the world, you don't even use those things. Now, to take an extreme, extreme case of it, when there's a good that, that uh, is uh, on the market, but which is not used, uh, uh, basically it has price zero, right? So you can, it's, 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 it's a bad even. It's not even good, it's a bad. So people who do numerical economics might say, well, these things are not, not even goods, they're just bads. I mean, that's, uh, in one, one extreme version. So I, I mean, I th obviously we, we can use these things, and how can we use them? Well, e econometricians can't use them. I'll put it this way. So uh, econometricians will once again they'll turn the CPU. They may even have a micro data. So if you do micro econometrics, you have a bunch of data. So you're gonna you're gonna beat beat up your disk. Uh, you may actually ship some data over the network. I put a small x there. Uh, you say you may you know download data from a you know from some web repository. But you're still there are big swaths of the machine that are not being used in any meaningful way. You're running regressions basically. So you're not even going to you're not going to visualize the result. You're running some multi, multi-dimensional regression. So you know, the punchline here is that it, with agents, we really are going to going to going to keep the box busy, right? We're going to fill up as much RAM as we have with uh, with agents. Uh, we're going to uh, display our results. Oftentimes, the display is the rate limiting step, right? We can't we can't compute the result. We can compute the results faster than we can display them. So this is this is a bottleneck potentially. Uh, maybe we can use some video cards. Maybe we, we need to use objects and other fancy languages, so I'll put this here. So agents are using at least more of the box, but now imagine a world, kind of, we were also tasked in this paper to think about the, the future. So think about you know, the agents 10 years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Think about there are very large data repositories, and uh, whether commercial or governmental ones, and you can really do agent modeling in real time. So it's not just that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna model the Washington housing bubble ex post after the fact. Rather, we're gonna get data from there was some jobs data announced an hour ago, two hours ago. Did we get a tweet about that? Was it, was it good news or was it bad news? I don't know. No, I didn't see we, 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 got some, we got some jobs data. I think, that, I think, I think what I saw was that uh, after, after dissing the stats for, for many, many months, we, 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 we now that our president thinks there was good, good jobs data. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so you really can line with statistics. <laughs> so, but imagine a world where, we can, where you can get real-time feeds and you, can, and you can spin up models in real time, so you're really mixing agents with data. <laughs> Now, I mean, you can really talk, start talking about using the entire box or using everything that's available here. In real, you know, real time, you're going to be, uh, you know, 
updating your models and running things. And uh, I mean, can we have a model where, like, you know, we're gonna we can predict? You know, there are very few, there are, there are not that many models that, you know that are predicting you know what the, what next month's job number is going to be. But maybe maybe there's a way to do that. So this is the third argument: is that uh, is that you know the, uh, all these things are good are goods, and uh, we, we're going to use them here uh, as opposed to the commit the conventional approaches don't really use them. Okay, anybody? Now this this may be this is a maybe may this uh, maybe some of you have not seen this argument before. Uh, I'm not sure we're <coughs> making it in the in the most uh, in the strongest way here, but uh, so happy to have your feedback and whether you find this. Uh, a strong argument or, or, or not. Lastly, this, is, this may be the most uh, <coughs> difficult one to explain because I'm going to go through a physical example model, but let's see if you let's see if you, how you how you get this. So when I was a, a graduate student, I went to the Santa Fe Institute uh, Winter School, the only winter school they ever had, where Mitch Feigenbaum gave uh, lectures. Now, some of you remember your chaos theory. Remember, Mitch Feigenbaum was the guy who did period doubling, right? So he showed how in a very one in a simple one-dimensional discrete time continuous state space model. As you varied a parameter, you first got you know an equilibrium, but then it would you know, then there were two things that would oscillate back and forth between. Then as you keep varying the parameter, you get you know kept doubling the period four, eight, six, until you got basically you got a continuum of the of uh, the, the number of periods had the cardinality of the continuum. You basically got chaos, uh, and uh, uh, and anyways, Feigenbaum as an early theorist, he was at Los Alamos, I think, we did the work. Is that right? Um, uh, as an early theorist of chaos, he recognized right away. He said said. Is it really the best use of our giant machines at the time? Now, the giant machines at the time were about as, about as powerful as Douglas Foreman, I think. But it, 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 machines of you know, the powerful machines of 1976, or whenever Feigenbaum did this stuff, Feigenbaum asked the question, he said, is it really useful as science to simply spin out these highly <coughs> erratic local densities of points that are chaos? Or is it more meaningful to look at the overall structure of the chaotic attractor? I mean, what do we care about? The local density of points in some, in some, in some phase space, or do we care about the, the attractor overall? And so uh, I've written that here. Uh, and so, as I say, uh, of course, his, his belief was that what you really cared about was the overall structure, not the local, uh, you know, the local fine details. And so what I've written here next is, is, a, is a version of this for the economy. And to say, this is how uh, you know, conventional economics is done, conventional numerical economics is done. You start out with the, you know, the real economy is here. Okay. Now we say there are abstractions, like I showed in the in the in the big table. The abstractions say things like, you know, let's assume that the economy is made up of one representative consumer, <coughs> one representative firm. Okay, some abstraction. From the abstraction, then you can write down equations. And from the equations, you solve for equilibrium. Now that may not be policy relevant because it's just symbols. So you now you have to plug in some numbers, <coughs> you get the numerics, and then you finally say, okay, let's raise interest rates by a quarter of a point. That's you know, that's, that's the in Washington, that, that's, that's what the Fed might do. Okay. Now, Fein, or, uh, Feigenbaum thought this process of of <coughs> using of exhausting your machines to compute local densities. He thought that was a foolish double regress. This is his terminology. I don't know where he got where he got the thing, got the idea from. For foolish double regress in the sense it was foolish because well, you didn't care about the local density. You cared about the attractor, and it was a double regress because instead of starting out with the equations. Which may or may not contain the, contain the guts of the attractor. You'd better off you'd be, you'd be better off finding uh, an analysis scheme to give you the attractor without have to, having to go through the local <laughs> density. Now, some of you will know that there grew up out of out of Mitch Feigenbaum's work something called Feigenbaumology, a whole elaborate technique for analyzing. Uh, kick, and uh, Eduardo can probably tell us all the details. There was a very complicated process by which you could actually discern the structure of an attractor by just looking at the equations. But, uh, I, want, I don't want to go into those details. What I want to say, though, is that uh, think about now how we do things with computation with agents. We, we set out with the same economy that, the, that, the, that we have uh, before. But now we say our abstraction is let's really write it in terms of how many people are doing what. You know, what, what are people buying, <laughs> selling, trading, forming firms, doing whatever. And with, with those people, we're going to right now ask how they interact. Do they, you know, what are they in fact, uh, are, they, uh, are, they, are they buy and hold people? Are they, uh, do they need a job? Are they unemployed? What are they doing? We write the agent model. We then spin the agent model forward according to those interactions and we get the answer. So it, notice it's both approaches start out with the same, the same, uh, have the same starting point and they both produce answers, but they, they get at it through a different way. And in particular, I guess that, uh, for me, the, and this is where I think the paper is trying to uh, you know, walk on eggshells here. We want to not be too uh, critical of this approach, and this is the way things are normally done. But to say that if you're going to if you're going to do numerics anyway, if you're going to have to reduce the problem to <coughs> to, uh, to to numerics, why go through this uh, 
this process here, which actually uh, adds error to your mo to, to, to your whole formulation, right? By putting in abstractions, by by making a bunch of idealized assumptions, by you know conforming with the norms of the of the modeling norms of the profession, you're basically impressing a bunch of error into your into the answer that that you can get. When isn't this a better way? Uh, yes. Can you add numerics into your agent approach because you can get from interactions to agents to numerics to answer? I suppose. Although it, it turns out that um, I, it's, a good, it's a good point, but I, now I want to ask you a question though and see what you think. Can we can we do agent models without numerics? That is, is there any way to write down an agent based model and actually kind of you know, run it forward in time without already having the numerics built in there? <coughs> So I, I take your point that you, what you want to say is you, whenever you have the agents, you have to then, then go to numerics anyway. It what I'm saying though is that it seems like it's almost impossible to build an agent-based model without some numerical specification. I agree. I, I think what, what I'm trying to get to with that comment is that you're not that far away from the normal approach you, in, in that you still have numerics in, embedded oh, yes, that's true. in, in yes, that's the right. solution or in your answers. And so I think that says, look, I'm not throwing away you know, the importance of numerics. Uh -huh. What I'm saying is that, you know, we start with the people versus the other It's fair enough. It may be a different way to say it. Maybe I'm using a code word here, too. When I think of numerics, I'm thinking here kind of things like numerical analysis. I'm thinking of, like, you know, newton raphson's solution of some equations. We're here, where the numerics that would enter here would just be something like, you know, I'm using statistics about the real thing to, to, to basically uh, uh, pin down the abstract model of something that's real. So, but, but, but fair enough. But I have an example but, coming but next. But to I mean, okay, so, so just to push yeah, it yeah. forward a little bit, right? So you can get from agents to <coughs> counting to numerics that then are, you can, you can put uh, equations and mathematical theorems on top of those curves and those numbers that are coming out of your, your agent model. Potentially, that's true. <coughs> and, and so then that gets you back to an abstraction. Mm -hmm. And so then, then the question is, right, is how, how uh, if we, when we do this, of course, remember from, we know from Herbert Simon, right, every time we run the model, we get a theorem. Uh, you know, if this, you know, if if we have an economy with these kinds of agents, then that the, that's a theorem. We're going to run it deterministically. We can fix it, random C, whatever, right? Uh, the, there's always a, the trouble with that perspective, though, is that we don't know the generality of the theorem, right? We don't, we know we know for this set, particular set of parameters, we, we got to, you know, we we got to a 500-pound shark coming out. But if we change the parameter a little bit, we might, we might only get a 10-pound shark coming out, you know, instead of a so. So, but, but if you make a thousand runs, a million runs, you can say, yeah, we, we know that, you know, under broad conditions, we always get to, you know. Markov perfect Nash equilibrium or something else. Mm -hmm. But I have an example coming up, so hopefully it'll help clarify a little, a little, a little bit. Yes, sir. I think the underlying mm -hmm. question there, and it's yeah. actually one of the more compelling reasons to use agents, is that the more mathematical machinery you apply to any subject, <coughs> the more you are driving the uncertainty from the calculations mm. into the assumptions, where it's much harder to detect. Methodology, you don't have a methodology that gets rid of assumptions, but if you can have a methodology that makes the assumptions clear, mm -hmm. and, that's and, a lot better scientifically. And easy to vary if you want to yeah. do sensitive analysis or something, right? Yeah. Fair enough. And maybe, you know, maybe you know, someone different way to say the same. I think your point is a good one to say that when, when you do this thing, basically what you're saying is you, you're, you're imposing a little bit uh, on the, even though, even though you've written the model at the microscopic level, you're saying agents do such and such, or you know, agents have preferences or whatever. By, by making a certain class of assumptions, you're, what you're really saying is you, you're, you're presupposing the kinds of things that can happen at the macroscopic level, right? You've, you've, you said not anything can happen, but only certain kinds of things can happen. Where in this case, it's a little bit more open-ended. Because now you can have you know, a whole variety of stuff can happen, right? It could be equilibrium, it could not be equilibrium, depending on what, what, what goes on. What we now call classical mathematical economics, which is almost a contradiction in terms, but <coughs> it's gotten old enough, it's classical now. Yeah. The extent and sweep of the assumptions <coughs> is heroic True enough. Uh, to make anything tractable. Right, all, all the preferences have to be transitive, right? So if you, if you, you prefer A to B and B to C, then you, then you prefer A to C, all, the, all those things that are known to be falsifiable in certain circumstances, yeah, yes. Yes? So in essence, the only, di I mean, this is kind of the same as the second reason or the behavioral approach? Okay. Because what you, well, I mean, that's yeah, what I mean. Uh -huh. Because the main difference is that the abstraction from people what I get is that uh, it, that's the nature of the micro foundation of the model. Uh -huh. So if you get a rational uh, agent, you will say that abstraction is better because the, the, the numerical answer is broken. Because you can solve it. Right. Uh, uh -huh. While you, you in the second one, you say it's people because you have certain behavioral traits that you want, you would like to, to explore more. And so you <coughs> explore that. But I mean, I, I think it's, it's <coughs> kind of the same idea of behavioral and uh, non-behavioral. I, I see the point for now. How about this though? How about the, 
it is it is the case that in the in the preface in the preface to uh, games and economic behavior by von Neumann in the fifties or forties, right? He says, you know, he says he says uh, game theory is static, you know, <coughs> single shot games, self equilibrium, right? Uh, he says if in fact we want to have dynamic game theory, von, von, von Neumann says this. He says that we need to invent a new kind of mathematics, at least as complicated, at least as you know elaborate as the calculus. So John von Neumann, a great mathematician of the 20th century, says, we will not have dynamic game theory until some smart guy invents a new kind of calculus for it. Now, the reason I <coughs> mention that is because, uh, think about the, the big table I showed early. I mean, imagine that that's, that some, you know, are the, the next Newton or Leibniz comes along, and they show us how to solve all the equations for all the stuff on the, on the far right-hand side, all the stuff that, like the real world, right? Now, in that case, uh, you know, in that case, you maybe you don't need to, you don't need to go to the numerics, right? But maybe the, the, you would use a different set of abstractions to get the answer. You can kind of jump over the over the numerics. I don't think it would be in that case necessarily a rational model, right? You could say, you know, maybe somebody shows us how to how to do all the math on the bounded rational model. So, but I think for for right now you're right. For right now, uh, th this looks a lot like one of the other uh, approaches because this is really this all this always involves rational agents. Although you now, when you think about the think about I want to maybe think about as you, as your uh, as your question is prompting me to think other things, think about the some of you will know the Colin Camer book on behavioral game theory. Mm -hmm. right? So the behavioral game theory book really says you know we're going to do mostly this except with bodily rational agents. Right? We're going to still hew to this this norm of uh, of trying to write equations and solve it, et cetera. So. <coughs> yes, Bill. Another difference I, I see between the, the normal approach and yep. the agent based approach is. How you describe your economy in the normal approach can be used in the in the agent mm -hmm. results mm -hmm. in the second one, where in the first one when you get to the answer, it's not described Good point. the same way. That's right. So right, the, the answers that th this can generate are going to be impossible or difficult <coughs> to do this way, but the reverse is not. But but anything that this this can produce, presumably we can get the same thing here, presumably. Although it, that's even more complicated because watch this. It, uh, uh, imagine that we have a model of general equilibrium or a model of rational expectations. It may be that to solve, to actually solve for equilibrium is a computationally intractable problem. Right? So then in that case, the agents can't even get there. Right? But, uh, but, but, you know, but it doesn't stop the conventional theory from, you know, for example, use of the Brouwer fixed point. Brouwer fixed point says under certain conditions an equilibrium always exists. It doesn't say what the heck it is. It says it exists, right? But, but it only exists because of that abstraction. True. That's right. Yeah. Sure. What I'm what I'm saying is, how you describe your economy in statistics, yeah. you can describe your agents in the same language. So you can compare reality <coughs> and your your model. Yeah, that's a good point. In yep. the same language, yep. rather than having to make a translation back through the theory. Okay. Yeah. And then my, my, my next example may talk to that a little bit. Okay. Yes, Mark. Okay, you're really simple. That's, that's right? so yeah. The difference I see is that if you're you have to have a science but not with real people. The yeah. Seriously. Right. And, and it's a very scientific approach. Uh -huh. to parse how they operate. Right. We're th th this already d d does violence. So we have a we have a we have a, a twenty person firm, and we're saying, well, you can just imagine this one one decision maker, and, the, and and that does away with all the rest of the people, right? So. Yeah. Well, so here's my example, and I, we we now let me just say that we use this example in the paper, and I, I'm very keen to have your opinion about whether it's too simple or whether it's or whether it, whether it gets the right point across. Okay. So here's the example. I mean, it's, it's the example of economics, right? It's, there is a demand curve, there's a <coughs> supply curve, okay? And remember, the axis for demand and supply is price on the vertical axis, quantity on the, on the horizontal axis. So there's demand is a function of quantity, supply is a, is a function of quantity. Equilibrium happens where those two things are balanced. And I've written Q star is the value, uh, Q star is the value that makes that true. You know, the error to Bruce theory really just involves <coughs> this, it's just this in multiple dimensions. And uh, we know it exists by the Brouwer fixed point theorem. Brouwer fixed point theorem, of course, is not constructive, so you don't, you can't compute the darn thing. Uh, <laughs> so as you know, so I want to co contrast this thing with also. Do, if any of you have ever taught microeconomics, you may have had the annoying uh, kid in the back who says something like, "says you, know, you, you draw the supply and demand, and you say, well, this is where the market operates,'" and the kid says, "Why? Why does it operate there? Right? How, how did it get there? Right? Uh, uh, is there some dynamic you can you can describe how it got how it got there? <laughs> of course, it exists." CSS. <laughs> <laughs> of course it exists, but does it, ever, does it actually work there or not? It's a different question. Okay, so the contrast is going to be 
uh, and uh, you know, it's going to be the, the net logo zero intelligence trader model. And if I'm glad Andrew's not here because he's so sick of me talking about zero intelligence that uh, I'm not going <laughs> to. But uh, uh, Brent is still working on zero intelligence, right? right? So, so it's, uh, it's, it's not good. Okay. So I'm, I'm pull it down. We'll, we'll run it here. Okay. So now I want to contrast then the idea of whoops. Uh, oh, I have a small question. Yes, Jessica. Uh, uh, maybe you talk about it, but I miss it. So I usually to see see two type of agent based model. Some of the uh, papers like uh, people wear very complicated mathematical formula to each agent. Uh -huh. That's what I saw a lot. There are and some also, cases like that, right? Yeah, and also I see some type of agents, uh, different kinds of have very simple rules. Mm -hmm. So I just don't know which one is better. Or I think in practice, there's actually a continuum. There are very few papers with, with extremely complicated uh, equations, and there are very few papers with, with kind of trivial zero intelligence rules in the, in the spectrum be along, the, along there. I think it, you know it is the case that uh, it's okay to have equations. I think as long as they're in, intra-agent, right? If they're inside the agent, you can say, well, there's some rich cognitive process that your brain is running that causes that. I think where the equations are problematical is when you say, I have to, I have to, uh, uh, you know, make a highly idealized agent in order to write equations inter-agent, in order to say like, you know, there's some social process governed by the equations. Now that I might have to do violence to the agents typically to actually write down those equations, so that, that, that's where sort of the problem is. So I, I, I think in the future, what in the future is going to be, you're going to have a very rich biological model of, of cognition. Okay. That's going to be something which is probably not going to be, uh, you know, statable in three equations. You know, it's going to be something that's going to be okay. more, you know, neural. Think about a neural network or something, right? Mm -hmm. So, but uh, it's going to be extremely complicated and really hard to verify. It's going to be a black box, unfortunately. <laughs> Really hard to verify. So we'll, we'll have to have the you know, we'll have to have the Samuelson class cognition cognition model or the or the Georgia or Scully one or something. We'll have to have, in the same way that we have you know certain you know we have certain well understood the Schelling model. We'll have to have certain kinds of uh, things that are, that are, are known. Or, or think about the prospect theory. Prospect theory is a, yeah. is a departure from rationality that's well understood yeah. by common person. Okay, so uh, so as opposed to supply equals demand, the quantity always exists, the market's always clear. I mean, think, so think about the, the net logo model here. Now, some of you will have, well, probably most of you have seen this. This is now one where we just say, okay, we have 40 buyers, 50 sellers, and then when I instantiate the thing, when I hit uh, when I hit uh, a reset, I'll, I'll reset it. We, we're going to get a. Uh, I'm off the screen. I'm make my screen bigger here. And you need to drag it to the right so you can access to your. Yeah. There we go. So I'll set it up. And basically, uh, notice it says that the maximum buyer value is 200, maximum seller cost is 200. So this is basically going to be sellers who are trying to cover their costs, buyers who are trying to buy things for less than their value. When we set it up, they have a uniform probability. The sellers have uniform probability of valuing between zero and between one and 200. Buyers have uniform value, value between one and 200. Don't worry about this parameters right now. It's not, not important. The main thing to say, though, is that with those agents that, that get instantiated, what we then do is we can build up a supply and demand picture. Right? These are the agents with the lowest, these are the sellers with the lowest cost. These have a little bit higher cost, higher cost still. These are the agents with the, with the highest cost as sellers. Right? And these are the buyers who, who value the good the most. They value it less, and these buyers value it the least. Right? So we have a supply and demand curve. It's, you know, it's, it's irregular. It's not, it's not as smooth as the book. But now I think that you know, in, in, the, in the microeconomics textbook, the fact that it's a perfectly smooth curve is probably a bug, not a feature. Right? It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's not, the real world is not like that. Uh, and then when, when this model runs, we turn it on, all we do is we, we just we, we pair these, uh, these 50 buyers and 50 sellers at random and we say, you know, uh, do you want to make a trade, yes or no? And basically, you know, if one of these sellers meets one of these buyers, uh, there's a good chance they can make a trade in, in here somewhere. If one of these sellers meets one of those buyers, unlikely they can make a trade, or they, can, they can't make a trade. But uh, in a minute, I want to talk about some weird things that can happen here. But for now, look at uh, you know, what, what the, there's actually a point prediction. I mean, to, to the credit of, of, of economics, microeconomics makes a point prediction. It says the quantity will be about 25. The price will be about you know, 100 here, halfway between 0 and 200. So the point prediction is we should get something coming out here. Now we can study that and see whether that works. Now some of you will know this is very much like the, the experiment that Vernon Smith ran in the 1960s, 1950s in laboratory setting at, in Harvard College, right? And he, the fact that he got things coming out that looked about right, he thought was a statement that, uh, you know, look, if markets, if markets required every agent to know what the supply and demand picture was, 
we'd be in trouble, right? Because there's a lot of computation to do, a lot of data gathering to do. One of the great things about Marx is that no agent needs to know very much, presumably, <coughs> and you can still get a good outcome. So let's actually run it and we'll see what happens. And uh, everybody has seen this more or less. This is basically a time series showing you know, one trade here, one trade here, one, you know, two trades down there. This is showing the time series of who traded at what price. The lines between the trades are meaningless. At, at, uh, but notice we, we, had, we did get, in fact, this, in this case, uh, the quantity came out to be about right. The quantity should have been 22, it says. The actual uh, quantity was 23, very close. Now, the prices are bouncing around here. The actual price, uh, the average, the actual uh, average price was about 105, should have been about 102. Now, there is some variation that's not zero, and it turns out this model has the property that as you make the number of agents bigger, the variation does not go away. But the main thing to say about this is that uh, when Vernon Smith first ran the experiment, he said, look, this is an indication that the, you know, the, the symbol supply and demand picture is about right. You know, the glass is half full, right? Now, there are these variations up here and above, about, you know, about around here. Now, I think you can also make the argument that the glass is half empty in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the, the point of prediction is not completely borne out. You're getting this variation. There are some people who are paying crazy prices. And some people are paying, you know, uh, paying way lower than they should. Now, one, one immediate question is, who are these people who are paying these un unusual prices? And how can we get more, how can we have, have, have more trades than are out here? And, and when you think about the supply and demand picture, I mean, uh, you probably haven't thought about it since you were an undergraduate, but think of that, uh, uh, and you, many of you have heard me say this before, but, you know, these people out here, these... These buyers are very strange people. If, if you think that, how could anybody with such a low valuation, when the, if the price were really there always, why would these buyers keep showing up in this market? They can't, they can't buy anything, right? The price is up here, they value it down here. Why would these high cost sellers ever show up in this market? I mean, are there people who go to the market every single week over and over again who never sell anything? I mean, obviously not, right? So, but, so what, you, what, you, what you can have in these markets is you can have things like, uh, you can have this buyer could be matched up with this seller and they can do a deal, right? Maybe at that price. And you could have this seller could meet that buyer, and they could trade at that price. And that's, that's a totally viable deal. Mm -hmm. So there's a richer picture behind the supply and demand story than, uh, than, than simply saying supply equals demand. The agent model already gets us that. Uh, I'd like to think that we could have this simple zero intelligence type model uh, in the undergraduate textbook. Uh, and basically, the, the assertion in, our, in, this, in this pedagogical paper will be that um, that's the way that we should move. We should sensitize undergraduates and you know, students, particularly freshman students, to the idea that, first of all, there's a richer story than just a point prediction. <coughs> there's stochasticity involved. Every time you run the model, you get a different answer, right? It's the same qualitative thing, but it's quantitatively different, very different, right? Every time you run, it's a somewhat different answer. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we can break people's... Uh, people's uh, uh, mindset from thinking that's, that the world is, is deterministic and reproducible, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so uh, we, 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 ha we have this model <coughs> literally in the paper with a link to a website where, pe where people can run it. Uh, we assert, you know, and this is where I think we're going to be in you know, some trouble that uh, we're asserting that, uh, you know, that uh, this is a better picture of markets than the conventional one that's in all of the undergraduate textbooks. And so that's, that's the, your referees are going to hammer us on that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, Doug? Well, the heroic assumption behind that equilibrium model is that everybody in the market has exactly the same perception of what is being sold. And there are very few real markets in which that is, in fact, true the case. Enough, true enough. And, and that's, that's how you get those very, that's that how you get the, the, the that giant price the thing, yeah. extremes, is, is that the buyers and sellers have Yeah, that limited, top right is called yeah, Nordstrom's. Limited information. <laughs> and the bottom right is called Bargain Hunters. Anyway, so uh, I'm definitely interested in having you guys feedback on whether you think that um, if, you know, if we start, if, so if Farmer and Axtell are going to tell the economics profession that, uh, that this is a better model of how markets work than, 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 the, than the normal picture. So see, see if we have any chance of making that, uh, that, that go through or not. You know how to recognize the pioneers, don't you? They're the ones with all the arrows sticking in them. <laughs> okay. So having said that, so these are basically the four arguments in favor of why, you know, why a young economist should kind of learn about agents and kind of get, to get, get, get busy learning. I've read a, I've, the final thing here is let's say we, we are going to put in the paper something about like, you know, I don't know what, this is not what we're going to, what, what it says exactly, but something like, you know, what are the risks of using agents? And, uh, and uh, here the idea is that imagine that we have that, that first table, right, where there's, there's the conventional way of doing things and there's a way that we really like to do things. And, you know, one of the, one of the amazing things about agent computing is that you can relax everything. I mean, you really can relax all those assumptions. And the trouble is, you know, if you did that, where would it get you, right? How, well, what would happen if you did that? 
the answer is we don't, we don't really know enough how to do it. So you would you would end up you'd end up exploring some completely new world. And uh, and you know is that new world you know have it, does it have anything to do with that with the real, with our world? You know I mean so for example I, I've been, some of you may have heard me say this before, but it's like it's like you know this new navigation is invented in the 16th century. Okay, so Christopher Columbus goes to the court and he says, "Give me a big ship and I'll and I'll I'll, I'll go to India and bring back all the gold." And what does he do? He gets in the ship and he goes. And he lands somewhere. He says, I'm in India, right? <laughs> and he was in India, right? He, he didn't know any better. He was not in India. And so I, the, wor the worry is that uh, you're going to get in your ship and you're going to sail off and you're going to say, I've solved the problem of general equilibrium now, right? Or whatever it is. I've solved, I've solved the problem of the economy, <laughs> unemployment. And you just, you know, you, you're, you're in an economy on Mars, but you're not, nothing to do with the economy on, on Earth. So, uh, anyways, I've written here that also. Uh, in order to then avoid this problem, you really need to have have micro data. Uh, and you see, unfortunately, in the current world, uh, much of the micro data that we have uh, is uh, is locked up behind some firewall somewhere, probably rightfully so, because it has privacy has important details in there, or it may not be available all. So we need to have a new federal research program or something to, to get to get the data. So there there are, pro there are issues with that. And then the final th bullet here is that um, this is something which my economic theory friends uh, have. Are, 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 will commonly assert to me, although they say it in somewhat different language, is that imagine if you could have a theory where anybody could do it. <laughs> imagine if it, was, if it wasn't just us, the uh, the the you know the the the, the you know the, the clerics of the of, of highbrow theory. If, imagine if anybody could do theory. That, that's a that's a whole new field. That's not that's not our field. So, uh, anyways, uh, I'm gonna uh, say it again, bro. Okay, so uh, the final slide here is just to basically to say that um, uh, there are other hurdles to uh, making this, to realizing this vision. I'm not, I'm not, I think I'll skip this one just to say we, uh, there's some, uh, I'll go right, go, right, go, go right to the conclusions here and just say that, uh, so uh, you know, Max Planck famously, famously said that uh, you know, science progresses one funeral at a time, uh, and it may be that there's no, uh, you know, for people who are deeply trained in mathematical economics, they may just never have the appetite to do computing uh, the way we want them to do computing. And so the question remains, you know, how to incentivize economists to adopt a more computationally enabled approach? How can we create computationally enabled economics? Uh, we, do, we don't have that today. Uh, the last thing is, you know, do we need to have a top-down intervention, you know, whether it be uh, a, uh, a new uh, research uh, outfit or, a, or an, a chief executive who says we need to do things this way from now on or something? In the meantime, uh, you know, we, uh, we proceed as we always do from the bottom up. So I'll stop here. Have it take your comments. Yes, Kevin. So it might be just the, the field I'm in, but I yeah. find that the, the direct competitor among younger um, uh, economists is yeah. microsimulation. Yes. And obviously uh -huh. the big um, distinction there is the use of social networks, uh, the things that you had in, in the, the yeah. columns there, but it is very data-driven. Um, and this kind of gets to your second point of the wilderness of bounded rationality, right. and that you have the same kind of wilderness with social networks mm. of, um, you know, I what don't, network do you I, use? Right? Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Or do you use a network? You know, business um, business executives, I'd like to assume, rely much more heavily for their business decisions on the actions of the Fed mm -hmm. than their friends on Facebook. So uh, at that point, you know, are social networks really relevant to, to, to economics? They might be, but, but the, the empirical data isn't in there to, to show Fair that enough. it is. Right, yeah. uh, especially with certain economic actors. So, so can, can, that, can that problem be fixed with, with, with better and more data, I guess? Yeah, or I mean, at the point of because agent-based modeling can use to your first point right. of can can derive its its conclusions on fewer uh, empirical data points, um, is it necessarily superior to microsimulation uh, in some regards? Or and so, just to clarify for the for the rest of the room, so by microsimulation we normally mean kind of like you know discrete event simulation of the kind that would be used in operations research and system engineering, and or you'd kind of have models in which there's kind of a, a stochastic specification of behavior. And there's not much interaction, or the interactions are only indirect. Exactly, right. where they all see some global variables, right. That's right. Uh, such as the Fed rate, uh, as you were mentioning earlier. But so I guess I guess there, you know, the, I mean, ultimately, we, we have we view microsimulation as, as 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 better than simply solving equilibrium, say. But uh, but but we, we if, in, if in fact there are social phenomena that need to have a deep behavioral specification, then we hope we can outperform them. But there may be many things that do not require much behavioral specification. Right? Maybe many. Right, right. And so maybe it's, maybe it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis as to yeah. which one is more appropriate. I just see in, in terms of public policy, yeah. obviously there's that, I, I think there's that, that kind of between need-based modeling and, and micro-simulation 
Yep. And, you know, micro simulation much better for those fine tuning things. Fair enough. Database modeling for larger yep. uh, system wide computers. That's the one thing. Uh, Rob, yes, Matt. Just with the, I suppose, the calibration with the data. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at, say, the, the global financial crisis about how the derivatives, right. everyone was interlinked, right? Now, that event hadn't really, it happened a little bit with when long term capital management went down. But yeah. if an event like that has not happened before, right. how can you build a model to calibrate with the data? You might go, oh, I built this model which calibrated in the past, yep. but there's no guarantee that that behavior is going to right. Fair occur enough. in the future, or there's some relationships change and your model doesn't pick but up. So, as opposed to thinking about, you know, kind of, uh, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good here in the sense that uh, what is the counterfactual? It is, what, how would the Fed approach the problem today? The trouble, if the Fed would approach it with econometrics. Yeah. And so, uh, if in fact you're in a new regime altogether, the econometrics will be very poorly uh, tuned <coughs> to be able to give any leverage. So, it may be the question uh, I would, I would, I'm asking you, I guess, is, is your, your, your experience in agent modeling math. And don't you think that if, if you had a deep process based explanation for what was happening, say, in the mortgage market, if you had that, yeah. and here's what the Fed did not have, and if you had the data. Hmm. Now, the Fed, by, by their own admission, in the last couple of years before the crisis, they, 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 they did not buy the data from CoreLogic. CoreLogic had the mortgage data. Mm -hmm. So when the Fed decided to bail out, to do the bailout, they did not know how many homeowners were underwater. They did not know uh, those data. They, the, 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 those, those data cost about a million bucks a year. They, they yeah. didn't pay for them. Uh, so, uh, but if, so do you think that there's a way, if you had a, a process-oriented model, you know, with, all, all the, you know, with, with some set of, you know, here's how mortgages get, here's, here's a secondary mortgage market, here's some derivative market, if you had that, and if you had the data that's, for example, that, that was available today at the Office of Financial Research, which is every transaction over $10,000, or whatever it is, yeah. could you build a model? Or do you, you think that would still be a daunting task? Well, I think you could build a model, but some of these models, I think sometimes like they become too complicated uh -huh. and you're going to get lost. Like, you know, with the artificial stock markets, uh -huh. the models become so sensitive to a certain parameter. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it, it, and so you might have it fine-tuned, but it's a bit... Over-tuned somehow. Uh, Over-tuned, you know, like maybe it's the equivalent of a, an Indy car engine versus, uh -huh. you know, just your basic Chevrolet. Well, so how about a practical well, question? One's going to keep going for 400,000 kilometers. The other one... Could how about the guys in the, you know, the guys in the Big Short movie? Right, there were four or five guys who made a lot of money in the Big Short. Right, <laughs> now they basically had models, mental models, or spreadsheet models, or something. Right, yeah. now of course the, the issue is that e many of their uh, you know, their shareholders or whatever did, didn't believe their models. Yeah. Right, so, so even if you, so I guess one, one way to say your point is that even if you had a model that was correct, it may be hard to find a policymaker who actually would believe in the model because of the na nature of the assumptions and everything that we have to go into it. Right? Yeah, I, I think that would you know that, that's you know the big sell. Right? Right. You know, if you had that model yeah. and you that guy in the big short, you yeah. said, well, I'm now going to tip this toxic bond into this model and look what happens. How about this? How about, how about, here's a different way to think about it. Imagine, imagine a world, we don't have this world today, but imagine a world with kind of you know, infinite computing power. Mm. We have a whole class of stock market model, a whole class of bond market model, whatever it is. Imagine now that one job of somebody at a university or somewhere is just run the goddamn thing for a million periods yeah. and mm -hmm. catalog the zoology of every possible model, every every possible catastrophe that can happen, and make a book of them or something. I don't know, yeah. make a database of them. So now, when you're on the on the potentially on the brink of a of a collapse, yeah. imagine if you had uh, you know a big book where you could say, this this looks like this particular thing. We are entering a regime that looks like this, and now you can say well, this might happen. And the reason I mention it is because it turns out the only time I ever met in my life I met um, uh, Lorenz of the Lorenz Attractor fame. Uh -huh. uh, he, he was commenting that um, numerical weather analysis was done like that up until about 1980, right? You would say, you know, mm -hmm. what's going to be the weather in Denver tomorrow? Well, you would look, you had this giant book of saying, well, if the pressure gradients are like this and there's this much snow coming over the Rockies, well, we think this is going to happen. And it was so done in this, in this kind of almost like a p pattern matching lookup way, right? Yeah. And so I don't know, I just, it seems to me that if you, if you had a rich enough model, you could maybe, maybe do like that. For, like, well, sounds <laughs> like Asimov. <Yeah. laughs> it's a matter of empirical, easily verified fact that the people who did the the court people at Fannie Mae had a model that pretty much showed what was going to happen. They said these uh, 
packages that we're pricing at 25 uh, basis points ought to be priced at 125 basis points. And they went to management. Management had taken a couple of good economics courses and drunk all Kool-Aid. They said, look, markets know what they're doing. The mm. market thinks you're wrong. Go figure <laughs> out what's wrong with your model. It's the efficient market theory. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we'll always be part of that one. So apparently they hadn't gotten far enough to be told that markets are myopic <laughs> and certain assumptions don't percolate in for a while. So hopefully a hundred years from now when our descendants are all doing this, uh, do, doing this modeling stuff, it's flaky modeling stuff. Hopefully they'll have better models than we will. And hopefully they will have, have experience to, you know, to, to know what's good and what's bad and they will uh, be able to make some progress. So let me just say that we've been going over an hour. So why don't we, why don't we stop here? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be around for another hour, so I'm happy to take questions. But um, thank you for your time. And if you have any uh, specific comments on the, what should be in this paper, what should not be in there, please uh, let me have those. Okay. Thank you. You're planning to submit this somewhere soon? Yes, it's going to the journal I passed Oh, that's good. I probably need to see. Yeah. Do you want it? Yeah. And that's it. Might not sell quite as well. That was Paul Sanders. That was part of the revered business. Of course, you can suck it. Hey, thank you. Yeah, because they're not doing it. Other people are 